All right, so hopefully you grabbed your handouts when you came in, and there's a note-taking device there on the middle of the table if you want to just take notes. There's some lined paper there for you. We'll ask questions throughout the evening, so if you want to jot questions down as they come, and we'll try to pause, and we'll do our very best to answer those along the way, okay? All right, so tonight, we're really going to just take a minute and just look at math class, how it might look just a little different, and a little bit about the standards. We're going to look about what does math look like in school. So we're going to take you through a little K-5 lens, take you through some middle school, high school, and then Becky's going to take you through some Khan Academy as well. And then we want to just think about how we can help at home. As parents, we just want to think, how is it that we can best help our students at home? And then with Khan, a little bit, we might need to learn a little bit of math about the math along the way. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes after elementary, it ch might change up a little bit, so Khan's a nice, nice place to go. All right, so you're going to have all those options tonight. All right, so in the math office, this was the math vision we have for all students in Long Beach. We want every student to be a confident and flexible mathematical thinker, communicator, and problem solver. That vision we have is in line with our college and career readiness plan, the graduate profile for all students K-12 to be prepared and ready for the, the working world once they graduate from high school and on to college and beyond. Okay, so we are, our vision is right along, you know, in lines with what we have in the district. Keep in mind when you think about that vision, one of the big new words in there is flexible. Okay, really allowing our students to have that flexibility in their thinking. All right, so when I think about the Common Core, there are some definite shifts in math teaching and learning. So the shifts in math, the first one is focus. So in our new standards, we have fewer standards in each grade. We have fewer standards with the intention to go deeper. So we have more of an understanding of the math. In the past standards, we would have multiple standards, quite a few more in our, in per grade. But now there's fewer with the intent to go deeper, with more understanding. The next shift is coherence. And coherence connects the math across the grades. So they build those foundational knowledge in math in our K-2. We began to build that with a little bit more application in 3-5. So they're prepared to do the work in middle and high school and beyond. So again, it's that progressive lens across the grades. And we have rigor. So I don't mean rigor in that this is hard. But rigor means that there is a balance to that instruction. Remember that being flexible? We want to make sure that the students not just know the math, but they truly understand the concepts that they're learning. Yes, that they can do those procedures and do them fluently, but they can really then apply the math to the real world. So it's not just about math in the classroom, but do they see the math outside of the classroom? Do they begin to make connections to the math that we even see it as adults? So those are those main shifts in the Common Core standards for mathematics. And those link to that math vision that I just shared with you. So hand in hand with that, we have standards for mathematical practice. Now the beauty of these standards are these are the habits of mind of a mathematician. These are the practices that our students are showing daily their understanding of the math. So there are eight standards for mathematical practice. They are the same practices for a kindergartner as they are for a 12th grader, an AP calculus student. They are the same practices. We want our five-year-olds to be able to make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. 
just like we want to have our middle schoolers doing the same and our high school kids doing the same. Mathematical practice three, we want them to be able to reason, to be thinkers, to be able to defend their answer and defend their thinking and then critique the reasoning of somebody else and be able to defend why. We want them to model with the mathematics. That, again, that's that practice where we want to connect the math beyond and make it connect to the real world and have purpose to truly understand what they're learning beyond just the book that they did. So when we ask our students, you know, what did we do in math today or where do you see the math? It's not just, oh, we're working on you know, addition or subtraction today or I saw it in my homework, but they're seeing opportunities to do math outside of the classroom. And then another one that stands out to me is attending to precision. We're right. We do want them to be able to attend to precision. It's important as a mathematician to get those answers right. So those practices, again, those are the habits of mind of a mathematician. These are the eight standards for mathematical practice for all students K-12. I do we have any questions so far? Do we have, hold on one second. I've been given directions to pass I my mic. Stanford. Do we have a, do we have another mic? Can you do me a favor? Can you hand the mic to Becky real quick? Okay, go ahead and ask it. I was just looking for a little more uh, explanation on number eight uh, at this point or at some point. <laughs> okay. So we're, go ahead. Wait, I don't get a chance. Okay. All right. So when we're looking for um, expressing repeated reasoning, we're looking for patterns. Where do we see patterns in the mathematics? Where do we see when students are looking to see what are those rules? What are those claims? What is that that makes something true? What might make something always true? That would be uh, my, my example for number eight. Okay. I have questions. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I have a question. Uh, you know, I, on the new standard, when you write down about uh, being confident, flexible, and mathematical thinker, what do you mean by mathematical thinker? Can you elaborate a little bit? Thank you. So in our vision statement, we want a student to be a mathematical thinker. We want them to be able to be a, a person who can look at a problem, be able to have multiple entry points to a problem, be able to pull in all prior knowledge to be able to apply that to whether it's a number sense problem, whether it's a word problem, whether it's a drawing, and be able to have, bring in all of their knowledge towards being able to solve that problem. So not just a direct procedural problem, be but be able to be that thinker that we want them to be, to be able to apply what they know to any context of a problem. Go ahead, Becky. I can add on a little bit, too. Um, sometimes there's math uh, presented in the news or in advertisements, and we want students to be able to make sense of, of an argument that's based on a graph or some data. Um, and so we, our job in schools is to equip them with the skills to think deeply about what's being presented to them and make sense of it, understand it, and, and question those things. So that's part of what also what we mean about mathematical thinker. Um, or even in math class to think of alternate ways to solve problems. Sometimes only one solution strategy is presented to students and they can think of other ways to solve the problem that sometimes are more efficient or involve a drawing and so forth. My question to you is based on mathematical thinker is uh, what, how you relate to rational thinker. Because mathematics deal, deal with a lot of rationality more than anything else. You know, you're looking at a logic, you're looking at reasoning, and I, I, I'm just uh, because if you use a mathematical thinker, I think we need to elaborate how you like my 
you know, my son, he's a, uh, he mar maro, he's a rational, you know, to, towards a rational being or mm -hmm. thinking or the emotional being, you know. Uh, we, we look at the problem, everything we look, you know. Uh, coronavirus, for example, we have a lot of data in there and how we interpret it. How come mathematical thinker can be developed if we don't have the capability or rationalize, you know, the, the process of, do of these numbers? Thank you. How much are students encouraged to have like realia, tangible things or manipulatives incorporated in, at any grade level using utilizing these type of practices? Okay, so um, good question. Number f the SMP number five is for them to be able to use those appropriate tools strategically. So in all grades, students have. Um, and a lot in the elementary grades, they're going to have a lot of those realia or they're going to have tools that they'll be using where they're building that conceptual understanding and they transfer that into a representation where they can draw their representation so when they're actually making that connection to a number sentence or paper pencil. So I would think that it's very heavily used in our K-5 and we're also making connections with that in middle and high school. Less so in middle and high school. Um, we have some manipulatives that we use in middle school f uh, called algebra tiles. Those are, are fairly commonly used. They help kids um, represent expressions like, uh, or equations like x plus 2 equals 7. And they would remove 2 from each side to find that x is equal to 5 in that case. Um, you'll see a little of that in an algebra 1. Um, but as you transition toward the high school classes, you're more likely to see representations like graphs graphs um, being connected to, to um, equations and expressions, um, and less so of the actual physical manipulatives. All right, so we're gonna move forward from here. We'd like to share um, a video with you that math is not about speed. And Dr. Joe Bowler, a professor at Stanford, has done a lot of uh, work in the area of mathematics, and we just wanted to share um, some of her thinking with you tonight.
Okay, so that's a little bit from Dr. Jo Bowler. Uh, we have cited um, her work, which is from UCubed, and that is on the blue paper that you picked up. We've cited several different resources. So if you'd like to hear more from Dr. Bowler and some of the work that she's doing um, and her site on UCubed, you'll see on the blue paper, you'll mm -hmm. see the, the, where the link is for that. Okay, any thoughts real quick on that math is not about speed? If that's the thought of the district as well, I'm assuming since she showed us that video, what's the reasoning behind, at least for the elementary age, for their testing to be graded based on how fast they finished? So let me just clarify. I think you're asking about the basic math facts? Like the math facts and F between four and eight correct under seven minutes, between eight and, well, I don't know the numbers. You know, it's like the, at the bottom of the page. For the basic math yeah. facts, okay. So we do have ba basic math facts in Long Beach um, in elementary school. And since we've had some with our new standards with the Common Core, we have gone out and we have piloted those math facts and um, with students. And there's been modifications made to the timing of them and to the number of items that they're given. And the reason that we can support still the practice of that is because on a daily basis in an elementary math class, we are practicing mental math. And in the mental math, we're, the, we're practicing those flexible strategies of what is most efficient for the student. So we've practiced that with students to show that they can show how they can recall facts either by memory, which is one strategy, or they can use other efficient strategies, and they can still show that they can do that with some automaticity with us in a certain time period. So there has been modifications because we heard you as well. And we, we, we noticed that in our students. And so that was in response to that. So it's not just on speed, even though there is a time to it, but it's really been that time was set by students. They showed us that they could show us their understanding in that amount of time. Good question. Anybody else? OK. All right, so we're going to just move forward a little bit from here. And we'll, let's just take a minute and look about in K, the K-5 world right now. And let's look and see what does math look like in the classroom. So just in case you haven't gotten into an elementary class in a while or maybe not in the last month or so, you might see students doing some work on the carpet together and they might be doing some counting collections. They might be looking to see how many things items are they counting there and how are they grouping them and working in partners together. Students might be working and creating big number lines across the board. So taking that manipulative that and making a real life chart where they can plot fractions or whole numbers on a number line, working together as partners, reasoning about their thinking. You might see this set up in a, in a primary classroom where students have multiple opportunities to see numbers in different ways and where they see that patterning happening, and where they're seeing days in school, and they're seeing tens and ten frames, and in base ten blocks, and making connections to what they know about those numbers and those days of, numbers of days in school. Some of you in elementary might be familiar with Gigi. Who's heard of Gigi before? <laughs> uh, I've heard, I heard that, I heard that over there. Right? And what we're finding right now, as you can see on the side here, it talks about think before you click. The teachers are encouraging the students to think first. Remember that vision to be a problem solver. When to think first before we problem solve, think first before we act, think first before we click. This teacher is using ST math for instruction in the classroom, helping kids make a connection. So even though they might have not have a reality in their hand, they're seeing visual images on the screen that they're making connections to. Small group instruction. The teachers are differentiating instruction based on data they've collected on their students, pulling kids in in small group to meet the needs of those individual students. Multiple representations. Students are, this is an example of another counting collection, where the students are showing multiple different ways that they might have counted, the way they counted, their strategy, their representation, 
that flexible mindset. So that's just a little window into an elementary, elementary math. So you have a trifle that you might have picked up on your way in, just real quickly. This is also found on our LBUSD webpage. And if you go to M for Mathematics, it's there as well. But on the back page of it, it really talks about what's in, what's out. So when we think about these common core standards, we think what's in, what's out. So what's in is we're building that conceptual understanding with manipulatives. We are not just teaching just steps. Again, we are teaching with understanding. Kids are talking in math. You don't walk by classrooms anymore and it's just quiet and you just hear a teacher. You walk by a math class now in elementary, you have kids in groups and kids are engaged, kids are asking questions, kids are sharing their thinking, kids are adding on, kids are defending. So that silence we might have heard before is out. What's in again is all those multiple strategies. Some of your kids might be coming home and showing you several different ways that they've learned to multiply. It might be different than the way we learned it. Okay, in our new standards to really show that understanding, there's multiple different ways that we can solve that problem. And we really wanna honor that. Children applying their mathematical understandings to new situations. Not just seeing it one way, but seeing it in multiple settings. And being able to think about how can they transfer their knowledge to that real world. Okay, so let's just take a minute to think about what happens before we even get to school. Does anybody have anybody younger that's not in school age, year, age years yet? Everybody's got school age kids, everybody's got, okay. Just, just all, all of them. <laughs> so just real quick, if we're thinking ages three to five, how could you help your child? Think about if you had little ones, did we help them learn to count? There is an importance there. It's the importance is in the sequence and thinking about how far can they count and building that sequence, just like we'd sing the ABC songs. Or working within five and letting them see how many do you have? They might have two. If I gave you one more, how many would you have? They might say three. If I take mine back away, how many do you have? Oh, I have two. All working within five. You might be reading counting books, playing games, singing counting songs. Does this sound familiar for those of us when our kids were little? You were their first teacher. You laid the foundation what, for what they're doing in school. And all of those ways are those ways that we can help our little ones before they even get in. If you look at the puppies at the bottom real quick, tell me, how many do you see? Somebody, how many do you see? Seven. Does anybody wanna share how they see the seven? How did you know it was seven? Real quick, right here in the front. How did you, you know it was seven? Huh? Yeah, How'd you I see? Count the one in the top and the one that's hiding in the middle. Oh, so you counted the ones across the top and the one that was hiding? Yeah. So did you see six across the top yeah. and one that was hiding? Raise your hand if you saw it differently than that. Oh, wow. So you can see around the room, there are different ways that we saw that. I know in our office before we came over, between three of us, we saw it three different ways. Mm -hmm. Again, so it's, those are that flexible mindset. It's not just one way, it's multiple ways. And that's starting with our youngest children, three to five, getting them ready. Okay, so what does it look like in a TK through grade two classroom? Okay, these are, the these are the things we're covering. They're counting, they're adding, they're subtracting, they're doing geometry, they're thinking about how they build things, they're measuring, they're finding out if something's longer or taller or shorter. There's a quote we love from Christina Tondabal. She says, number sense is taught, is caught, I'm sorry, not taught. It's through experiences that we learn about numbers. It's through experiences that we count and we see the quantity of things. It's not just about being taught that two plus two equals four. Look for me real quick here at these two plants. How are these the same? How are these the same? Somebody raise their hand and tell us real quick. How are those two plants the same? Anybody? Do you want me to hold them up for you? Yeah. Anybody, what did you say? They both have green. They both have green. Nice. Anybody else? How are they the same? 
They're both plants. Anybody else? Oh, they're sitting on the same table. Okay, so how are they different? How are they different? One's tall, one's short. One has purple, one doesn't. Anything else? Say it again. Different containers. So again, we are asking our students, just reasoning, just with what is the same and what is different. That's a normal routine in a primary class and even in a grades three, five class. Getting our kids to talk and share their flexible thinking and reasoning about what they notice. Let's do one more together real quick. I just took this from a first grade class. The question was, Tell me everything you know about the number 12. What do you notice the students were thinking? What did they notice that they knew about the number 12? How to break it down. Who can add on to that? What do we mean by how to break it down? How many other numbers can you use to make the number 12? Who else? What else do we notice that the students did? Mm -hmm. They applied it to real world. Can you tell us more? What do you mean about that? They saw it in the real world. They saw 12 as eggs in a carton, 12 donuts in a dozen. What else do we notice? Anybody else? Are you wondering about anything about what happened in this classroom and what they're sharing? Or is there any strategy up there that you're not sure about? That 10 box thing. Okay, I think we're talking about this. Are we talking about this one? <laughs> that thing. So this, this is called a 10 frame. This is something very commonly used in a classroom. And the kids learn that they start off in kinder with this is five. How many more do they need to make five? When it's all filled, they recognize it as five. Then they see it as a 10 frame. They can tell you when it's all filled up, it's a 10. If there's one missing, they can see that it's nine. In a double 10 frame, they can see it's 10 and some more. How many more? Two more. So that's a normal routine. That, that's a, a strategy that kids would see. The teachers would use those in class. The kids can draw those so they can show their 10. Anything else up in there you're wondering about? OK. The doubles fact. That is something they will teach them, yes. And the kids come up with that, and they use the double sometimes, too. Let's look right here on this one. One student saw the 12 as a doubles fact, something they had memorized. Another student could see it's a double, but they like to make a 10. So they could see that in 12, there's a 10 and some more. So they like 5 and 5, and some more was 2 more, made the 12. So that's another example of a double fact. But that's one that a lot of times our kids feel are very friendly. So that's one that they like to memorize. Okay, so that's a little peek into K2. We're going to take a minute and look at 3 5. Okay, so our 3 5 students, we have multiplication, division, we have fractions, decimals. Geometry, measurement, data, look familiar? Okay, what you're seeing on the screen here is just a progression of the math. So again, when we talked about earlier, one of the, one of the shift changes in coherence is, is that the math progresses, progresses across the grade spans. You can see how multiplication is introduced and how it builds. It's not until fifth grade that that standard algorithm is in place. So let's just take it real quick and think about how can we help at home. So on your green paper right there in front of you, you've got some ideas of, that we took from Tim Kainel and Matt Larson. Those are two mathematicians um, that we refer to a lot. And in a book they wrote, they shared this with us. These are eight great ways we can help our kids at home. Work with them on recalling those basic math facts. But that's not just about over practice, practice, practice. Think about when you're walking through the grocery store, or you're driving in the car, can you work on those basic math facts? 
listening to your student, do they recall it by memory? Or maybe they need to think about a quick strategy, six times four. If we don't come up with 24 right away, what's happening in our head real quick? We might think of six times two and six times two, 12 and 12 is 24. Play games, we talked about that earlier. We're providing support with problem solving. I think a big one is finding math anywhere. Where could we provide opportunities for math out in our lives with our students? The grocery store with money, time, measuring things at home. This is a, which one? Baseball and basketball. Oh, baseball and basketball. They can tell you right away how many points they need to win the game or how many they lost by, or how many they won by is even bigger, right? Parents, this is a big one, monitor your attitude. What does that mean? We need to make sure if math wasn't our love in school, we don't wanna share that with our kids. We wanna set a positive growth mindset from the beginning with them. We can do this and we can do this together. Okay, we wanna share all positive thinkings with math. And then the last one, ask these questions, why? And how do you know? My turn. I don't know if this is working. There we go, my turn. Um, so I'll remind you, my name's Becky Afghani. I'm the secondary math curriculum leader for our district, so I'm Lisa's counterpart. Um, and I'll be talking with you about math in middle school, math in high school, um, and a little bit at the end about how you might be able to help yourself learn the math that your students are learning at any grade level um, if, if you would like to help them do the math. All right, so, oh, I need the clicker. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about the courses that we have at each of these levels, and then I'll talk a little bit about the math that you'll find at the levels, and then um, how you can support your, your child at home. So we have two common math course sequences in our middle schools. And there's a little picture here. Um, the sequence across the top row and the sequence across that bottom row. Right? The top row of classes are math six, math seven, and math eight. And each of those courses addresses one grade level of content right, in a year. Right, so it's a nice, comfortable pace. Um, it is the pace that the authors of the Common Core State Standards intended for students to learn the math in middle school. In our school district, however, we've, we've had a longstanding history of, uh, of having about half of our students complete Algebra I in the eighth grade, and that is still true today. In order to make that happen, to, for sixth and seventh grade, we have compressed the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade content standards into a two-year sequence. And those courses are titled Math 6 Accelerated and Math 7 Accelerated. Students who successfully complete that sequence then do take Algebra 1 in the eighth grade. That course is identical to the high school Algebra 1 course. Same book, same tests, everything. It's identical. Um, if, if your student uh, isn't placed into Math 6 Accelerated in the sixth grade, there is another opportunity to move into algebra after math seven if the student uh, is getting A's and B's in their math class and meets standards on the um, CASP or SBAC assessment that they take at the end of the year. So those are the middle school math courses. So then after grade seven, you can take algebra one even if you're on a first class? If you get A's and B's in these courses and also met standard on SBAC. Yes, then we feel that they have enough understanding of mathematics to be successful in Algebra One in the eighth grade. So what math is addressed at the middle school level? Um, I, I'm certainly not going to capture it all, but I'll give you a few examples. Um, it isn't until middle school now that students are introduced to negative numbers. So in elementary school, they learn about all of the numbers on the right side of zero on the number line, including fractions and decimals. And in sixth grade, they learn that the left side of the number line is a mirror image of that. Right, so there are whole numbers left of zero, but also there are numbers with fractions and decimals um, attached to those. Students will order those numbers on a number line, um, make sense of them in real life contexts, like money, <laughs> owing money and debt, 
um, and also add, subtract, multiply, and divide using all of those types of numbers. Um, some of the geometry concepts addressed in middle school include uh, the Pythagorean theorem, which is shown there, um, finding a uh, missing side length from a right triangle, um, and also area and volume of figures. You might recall solving equations. <laughs> right, this is middle school content. They'll find the value of x that makes that equation true. Um, they'll also graph equations with uh, x and y coordinates. They'll uh, work on linear algebra a little bit in middle school. Um, and also there are, there's quite a bit of statistics in our statistics and probability in our middle school curriculum. Um, in fact, it's been completely omitted from K-5. Um, they don't learn what average is uh, even in elementary school. All of that waits until middle school. Um, and they learn about uh, measures of center and spread. So statistics became much more intense at the middle school level, um, which is great for our kids because it's everywhere in the world and their careers. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. So it's, uh, so how far into statistics do they go in the middle school? Um, and they're not doing, did you say t-test? No, they're not doing t-tests. <laughs> um, so how far? Uh, like I said, measures of center and measures of spread, I would say for the most part. Um, bivariate data, if that means anything to you. Yeah, the shape of a curve, um, whether it's skewed, well you might remember the normal curve, and whether it's pushed to one side or pushed to the other. That's all middle school curriculum. Um, at the end of the year in middle school, so we want to make sure that kids actually get all of the math that the, uh, we just that are they're designed to get. Okay, how can you help at home? So I, I cheated with this first bullet, and it, you'll see it on the high school slide as well. All of the earlier suggestions, <laughs> plus um, support practice at home uh, in any way that you can. I, it's at middle school sometimes students begin to feel less confident in the mathematics and they may struggle more with some of their problem solving. And uh, I would encourage the parents to help your child persevere through the practice. Just keep trying um, and not to quit so easily. Y you see the students playing video games and when they hit a wall and their character dies or maybe they're shot to be more appropriate or more timely, th they get back up and they try again. Sometimes our students are learning with math that they just quit. Uh, and that's not how anyone learns to do anything, is by quitting. Um, I, I heard that Kobe Bryant made something like three million shots in his lifetime uh, and made a very small fraction of those. So helping your child with perseverance would be very helpful. Um, also make sure that they are able to analyze the errors that they make and learn from them. Rather than just getting frustrated by making mistakes, to look to see wha where the problem lies. Uh, um, and there are a lot of apps out there to help students get right answers. So I wanna, want you to know as parents that they exist. Um, as teachers, we just sort of shrug our shoulders and, and gave up the fight on that. Um, you can Google practically any math problem and get an answer. Right. S the answers to the odd numbered problems are in the back of your textbook. Right. Uh, there's uh, something called photo math. Has anyone seen photo math? Yeah, I got some nods. You literally take a photo of the math problem and it gives you the answer. <laughs> right. So math is not about answer getting. Math is about understanding the process to getting the answers. And sometimes the answer can help you with that understanding. Like if you know the answer is five, you might be able to work backwards to figure out how to get the five. Right? So as a parent, be aware that the answers are out there. Right? Please help your child try to persevere through problem solving and try to figure out how to get the answers. It's about understanding more than it is answer getting. This is, this is a big one. It's about at the middle school level where many of our parents, in, including myself, um, reach our limit in how much we're able to fully help our students solve the math problems. Right? At, and if it isn't at middle school, it'll be sometime. Like my, my kids took calculus in high school. I don't remember the calculus. You know, so at some point, y 
they'll need to learn to help themselves with mathematics, and you won't be able to help them do all of the math problems. So you can help them by asking them some questions. Do you have some class notes on this math? Do you have any examples in your notebook that you can look at? Um, where is your textbook? <laughs> on what page what might you find an example that looks just like this? There is online help available, and I'll talk more about this. The whole end of our presentation is really about Khan Academy. Um, but there is online help available with Khan Academy and Big Ideas. And this was big for my children. <laughs> Phone a friend. Right, math is something that people do together. It is not meant to be an individual learning experience. We learn from communicating with others and using those math words. So call a friend, talk on the phone, um, and also Long Beach Unified School District has a homework helpline service, and the phone number is right here. Um, you, they can, students can call and ask a teacher for help. And in our helpline, um, our homework helpline classroom, the teachers have all of our textbooks to refer to. Um, and there, are, I know a few high school teachers that, that man the homework helpline. I'm going to move on to high school. So are there questions about middle school before I move on? Ooh, a couple. Uh, do you want to use the mic? OK. How can, how can you, or do you have a suggestion for a particular strategy when it's the behavior or the attitude that gets in the way of learning the math? I'm going to use the same thing I would use in a classroom. I, a broken record. Just keep trying. You, you can't, when you stop communicating your message, it means, um, it means that you're giving up on, on your child and, and letting that behavior be OK. So just keep communicating. Like, you can do this. Let's keep trying. What have you done? You're going to see another, um, another item listed here when I get to the high school slide that says something to the effect of, Get help. Ask for help. Have you asked your teacher for help? How can you ask your teacher for help? When will you ask your teacher for help? Do you want me to go with you? Um, but students need to start to advocate for themselves, too. And th many uh, around middle school, they get to be very reluctant to do that. Um, the helpline, is that 24-7 or? Oh yes, can the, my son call on the weekend or? If you go to the Long Beach School District website and go to H in the alphabet, it's lbschools.net, go to H in the alphabet, you'll find homework helpline there. And on that page, it'll tell you the hours and the phone number. Right. And it, it isn't 24 seven, no. They have to pay a teacher to, be, to answer the telephone. So it's, it's after school and I believe it's just weekdays, but it's on the web page. Kudos to my former middle schooler who's now in high school, to uh, his, teach his teacher, two main factors that contribute to his success in math. He's a visual learner auditory. So this teacher made it a point to make full use of school loop. She went ahead and uh, um, utilized it to the point where we knew exactly what he was learning. So there was that constant communication and she used a lot of visuals. I mean, she's been a teacher for a long time. So I think being in touch with the different learning modalities in the classroom are very important factors that will help sometimes break that disconnect between the home and in the school. So that was two biggest factors in his success as far as reaching his goal of understanding the material. So that's something that I'm encouraging the, the school district to encourage st uh, teachers to utilize school loop to the best of their ability as a big communication uh, connection, I guess, to our parents. Thank you for sharing that. The homework helpline the homework help is open Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Or you can reach helpline teachers at homework at lbschools.net. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to high school. Um, we'll start uh, by 
taking a look at the math courses that students should be taking in high school, and I've, I've opened this with a couple of pieces of things you should know. Uh, one, the Cal State University system in California, I was gonna say in the California state, <laughs> um, requires that students take Algebra one, Geometry, and, al and Algebra two, and get a C or higher in each of those courses for students to be eligible to even apply. Right? And that requirement is identical for the UCs, but since the UCs are so much more competitive, they actually strongly recommend four years of mathematics. So taking another course in addition to um, and after Algebra two. Our high school graduation requirement is four years of mathematics. Right, but unlike the CSU, we don't require specific math courses except for Algebra One. Right, passing Algebra One is a required graduation re is a graduation requirement, um, not the C or higher. But students need to continue taking math classes in Long Beach Unified for the four years to graduate. Right. Common course taking sequences is what I try to to show here. Um, Commonly, we see students take, this is much like probably what you all took in school, things haven't changed an awful lot, Algebra one, and then Geometry, and then Algebra two. After that, we recommend that students make a decision in their next, uh, about their next course based on what they want to do after high school. If they are considering a major or a career in a STEM industry, that's science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, then they really want to take pre-calculus and calculus. Like it, it, the engineering field needs you to take calculus. You can, however, take it in college. So if you only get to pre-calculus, that's fine. Right? You can take it in college. Um, if you're not pursuing a STEM major or career, um, we have a good number of other courses. I wrote many choices here. Um, among them, is Intro to Data Science, which is an introductory statistics class, right? And that could be followed by AP Statistics. How far you get in this pathway depends on when you take Algebra One, right? Which is why we had those differences in the middle school sequence. So if this is in the eighth grade, then this is nine and 10, 11 and 12, right? If this is in the ninth grade, we're gonna get to here, right? Um, the great news um, on both of these <laughs> is that our universities provide courses just like all of these. So if a student doesn't reach the very ends, right, it's not too late. Right? Um, the Cal State system has dropped their algebra, let's say it's called college algebra requirement for students that are not in a STEM major. So that's very interesting. Um, many of our students, saddens me to say, don't love math. I love math. <laughs> um, so if they don't want to pursue this path, this is a great path. Um, if they enter Cal State Long Beach in a major that's not a STEM major, they can take then a statistics class or a quantitative reasoning class. Um, both of these courses um, are great preparations for that path. How can I help at home? I told you I cheated. So you know the first bullet. All of the earlier suggestions plus. Um, if you ask uh, our high school math teachers what is the number one reason why a student might not be successful in high school math, they'll actually tell you attendance and tardiness is a big problem on our high school campuses. Um, and I've heard from a number of parents that they drop their kids off on time and they know that they've gotten to school on time and yet they're surprised to get a phone call that says your kiddo was late to class <laughs> or didn't show up for that first period. And we would just encourage you to have a conversation with your child, that's all. Where were you, what happened? And that makes an, a world of difference. If the student's not in class, they can't learn mathematics. The other uh, bullet is related to what I talked about with the middle school students. It's around this age that students become reluctant to ask for help. Um, so please do what you can to encourage your child to ask the teacher for help when needed and to ask your teacher how they might be able to improve a grade 
um, that they're not happy with, including individual quiz and test scores. Um, I believe that's the end of the high school slide. So do we have questions on high school? Are there any math-like classes, such as logic um, classes, that would um, teach the same kind of logical concepts but not actually be using numbers? Not really. Um, there are other choices for math classes in Long Beach Unified School District to meet the math graduation requirement. For example, students can take um, computer science courses and they will satisfy the math requirement. Um, so that is a different type of thinking and maybe less numbers, it's programming. Um, there's a good amount of programming in that intro to data science class as well, if students are interested in that. Um, we have an intro to applied math course that is like a fourth year math class that, that talks about how math is used in the real world in various contexts like sports and the media. Um, but it's not a particularly rigorous class. Um, and doesn't meet the uh, A to G standards from the UC or CSU. Just ask, and I'll repeat it. So how a person, how a student goes about asking the teacher for help was the question. Um, each teacher will have, uh, have their own preferences for how they provide help outside of the classroom setting. Um, that's a great question to email to the teacher. Like, do you open your door in the morning um, to offer help, or at lunchtime, or after school? Um, but the vast majority of teachers will have an answer for you to tell you when, when they're available for extra help. It will likely be different for every teacher. Okay. I want to add, I wanna add uh, high schools also offer peer tutoring in the library before and after school. Many of our high schools. And you, you can email the teacher about that or email the school counselor or even the principal or call the office. Oftentimes the secretary will know when the tutoring hours are. Sometimes um, we should sometimes reflect upon how we were in high school. Sometimes it is a lot to ask for children. Not that they're not mature, but sometimes they might not know what to ask or they don't want to ask because they don't want to seem like they're not smart enough or whatever the, que the, the situation may be. So I think I have learned to try to model as a parent how to go about getting the information that I'm looking for, w whether it be an email and how does that look like, a phone call and how does that look like, mm -hmm. a meeting and how does that look like. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be there, they're only there for a short amount of time because time is of the essence for teachers. So I think sometimes it's not always our kids' lack of involvement. It's sometimes they might not know how to go about it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And um, I didn't mean this to suggest that you shouldn't email the teacher too directly or pick up a phone. I just remember when my kids were in school, they were less happy with their mother for doing that. But I did it anyway. You know, you are your child's number one advocate. So if, if don't please don't hesitate to, to go ahead and make that phone call and email the teacher. Okay, we're going to go into our last section. Oh, my clicker has decided to stop working. So I'm going to go over here. Um, we're, we'll talk about ways. Do you want to be the mouse person? Thank you. <laughs> um, ways for you to help yourself learn the math. Um, and this could be at any grade level. Uh, the, the way math is being taught uh, today is different from the way it was taught years ago. Um, so you might want to refresh your memory on fractions. Right? Or maybe it's Algebra 1, or maybe it's Algebra 2. Um, Khan Academy is really a great place for you to go to learn more about the mathematics. And so I'm going to walk you through some basics of how to use Khan Academy um, to help yourself learn math. But please also know that students are often using Khan Academy to help themselves learn math as well. So the website is here. It's www.khanacademy.org. Um, and on the next slide, um, this is a picture of the home page when you first arrive to Khan Academy as a, as a parent. Students have accounts. Um, students have already likely set up accounts uh, if they're in grades six and up in Long Beach Unified. 
So here on the home page, you'll see on the upper right hand corner, uh, it, there's a, a place for you to click to sign up for an account. You can go ahead and click. That'll take you to a page that's going to ask you how you would like to join Khan Academy as a learner, as a teacher, or as a parent. So you'll click parent. You can go ahead. You want to go back for a sec? This logo at the very top of the screen is will take you to the home page at all times. So once you've set up your account, you can go ahead and click on the home button at the top. And you'll see um, kind of a welcome screen for you as a parent. And it will ask you to go ahead and connect with your child. So I've, I've done this. That's, that's me in the upper right hand corner. Um, my kids have graduated from high school and, and I am not going to be helping them with math. So <laughs> I haven't actually added a child here. But you're going to follow the steps to add your child. And you can monitor their progress in Khan Academy. Um, really cool thing about Khan Academy is they have worked to translate their entire website into 33 different languages. Right? And so I want to point out that if you want to change your own language to a different language, if you click on your name on that upper right hand corner and then click on settings, go ahead, you'll get to a page where you can choose your primary language. And in this dropdown, there are 33 languages. Um, they're written in the language <laughs> um, themselves, so I couldn't recognize most of them. So it, it's very neat. Um, once you do change your language, you should know that everything in the entire interface changes to that language. Right. If you click on the Khan Academy logo at the top, it'll take you back home. And from here, you might want to look for some math right, that you would like to learn. Right, the easiest place is to go ahead and search under courses and look at all the courses that they've built in Khan Academy. Um, these are high school math classes. I see Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. There's more than that. There's even Calculus. Um, they've partnered with College Board to provide AP support. These are math by grade level, so all the way from kindergarten through math eight. While I'm here, these are a bunch of science courses like biology, chemistry, physics. Um, these are all of our history, not our, these are all of their hi uh, history course connections, um, including AP art history. I mean, it isn't just the, 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 the history you normally think of. Um, and very popular in our school district and for high school students is SAT prep. Um, when our students take the PSAT in school and connect their college board account to Khan Academy, it'll actually give them SAT practice that is diagnostic for them, meaning it knows what the kids got right on the PSAT and what they got wrong, and it feeds them content. Um, and they have research that shows students who spend tw 20 hours in SAT prep have raised their scores um, 150 points. So uh, this is free SAT prep. It's really trying to level the playing field. Um, but we were talking about how to help your child in math. So let's say um, it's fifth grade math that I'd like some support with. I would click on fifth grade. And in this screen, you'll see, and this is true for all of the grade levels or courses, on the left side, you'll see a what they're going to call a course summary which is a listing of units. You would need to read through those and get an idea what you're looking for. On the right side of the screen, you'll see each of these units has been broken down into some subtopics. Right. I, I think I'll skip the video because we're going to, no, I'll show it. Um, go ahead and click and let's see what we have. Um, I clicked on strategies for adding and subtracting fractions with unlike denominators. And you'll see over here in the content, let's do another click. And maybe one more. What you'll see presented here will be um, up to three different kinds of content for students and for parents. This icon with the square with the triangle inside, this is a play icon. And this indicates that it's a video clip. There are also articles, which look like pages from textbooks. Um, and there are also problem sets, which the kids like to do, is when they get the problems right, it gives them confetti. You know, and if they get it wrong, 
it actually just leads them to additional help, like the videos. So usually our students start with the problem sets. I would too. It's a good place to start. Um, another click. And I've got a hyperlink on the bottom just to show you. Could you go ahead and click on the hyperlink? I'll, sh I'll show you a couple minutes of a video from Khan Academy just so you can see what that looks like. Um, if you have changed your language to a different language, the text and the audio of the video will be in the other language, which is really cool. Got to do. If you push the space bar to pause, um, you can pause these videos. You can back them up um, underneath the closed captioning down here. You can change the closed caption to a different language and keep the audio in English if you want. Um, under the gear, you can change the speed so that it can go faster or it will go slower. Um, but these videos are fairly low tech, right? Audio and a handwritten description. Um, I have searched for help to remember some calculus and it was very helpful to me. <laughs> I mean, so the span of what he has, the range of content that he has on this website is really remarkable. We can go to the slideshow. Um, and so finally about Khan Academy. Yes, it's a way that you can help your child in math, if you still want to be helping your student get the answers to the math problems, um, you can help yourself learn the math. But really importantly, we would like for students to be learning to use Khan Academy as a tool for helping themselves. Um, and if they can learn that that's a way to help themselves be successful and persevere in problem solving, right, in say middle school math, um, by the time they get to high school math, they've internalized it enough that they're seeking help not just with math, but also with other courses um, and becoming more independent learners, um, which is ultimately our goal. I know you like to help your kids with math, but ultimately we really do want them helping themselves. Um, we will all reach a limit for how much math we can help our kids with. Um, they are likely to exceed our mathematical memories. Right? And I believe that takes us to our last slide, which is just a reminder of what these resources are that are in front of you. So you have, this is the blue sheet, right, which includes hyperlinks um, to a number of resources, some of which we referred to tonight. Um, this very first one is a whole description from Khan Academy um, of how parents can help their students in math. Um, the next one, I think it's a click, that's the parent brochure, which gave some suggestions for supporting your child in K-5 math. And the last one, was that list of eight ways to support your students' uh, math learning at home. And one more click, and we can just end with some more questions. Are there more questions? There has been a big emphasis on the use of Khan Academy. How, okay, question is, how is Khan Academy, is it aligned with the SBAC testing um, and also the, curriculum because I've heard mixed messages from s different teachers like no 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 we're not doing it the Khan Academy way we're going to do it the district way so I know there's a big push on using Khan Academy but is Khan Academy aligned with the district's 
curriculum standards and SBAC testing? One of those questions is easier to answer than the other. So um, Khan Academy has aligned their content to the, to the Common Core State Standards. And as such, it's well aligned to the SBAC. Right? So, so the, the state test at the end of the year addresses the standards. Now, it, Khan Academy did not choose one publishing company with a textbook to align their curriculum to. So an approach presented to solve a problem in Khan Academy for solving a two-step equation might be different from the approach used in the Big Ideas math book. Does that make sense? However, it is our job as educators and parents to produce flexible problem solvers with a, students that have a variety of approaches and can make sense of another approach and determine whether that approach is more or less efficient. Right? So we would hope right, that the use of Khan Academy would only broaden right, the students' understanding of mathematics. They may very well learn a, um, a sequence of steps to follow that might not match the textbook um, entirely. Right, but it should be aligned to the state standards just fine. Does my third grader have an account with Khan Academy already? No. Um, we, the Long Beach Unified School District has partnered with the Khan Academy to make some things a little bit easier for our teachers and students in set to set up accounts um, and gain access to them. So. If the teacher has activated their class all right, using our district tools, then your student would already have an account. But at the elementary school level, it's fairly unlikely that teachers are using Khan Academy in class. Um, we, we don't tend to use. I mean, it, it's a 6 through 12 platform that our teachers are really far more likely to be using Khan Academy. Um, we have this gorgeous ST math, um, uh, uh, you saw Gigi the penguin, right? Many of our elementary school teachers are using that online platform to deepen students' understanding of the concepts in K-5 math. And so to also introduce Khan, it, it just has become cumbersome and too many things for our, our, our teachers to juggle. If you want your child to work in Khan, um, we, we absolutely would support that. We don't think there's anything wrong with it. But in the classroom, it would, it would likely be competing with our time. Uh, and so we aren't tending to promote that much at the elementary level. Would you like to set up an account for her? You can set up an account for her. Um, I would encourage you to have your student log in using Google, because all, all of the students have Google email addresses um, through the school district. And that way, your student won't make another account when they hit sixth grade. So at the end of the day, the student has to follow whatever platform the teacher is using. Um, your, st your students will be given assignments from their teachers. Could be from the math textbook, could be from Gigi, could be from Khan Academy. Um, the assignments that the student has been asked to complete outside of school to support the learning that takes place in class would be good if, if the student was doing what the teacher asked. On top of that, if you would like to supplement I, by using Khan Academy, for example, if it's not used in class, there would be nothing wrong with that. It's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt that. Any more questions? Anything online? No? You're gonna say more than I wanna repeat. We've often just um, searched on YouTube, and there are very kind parents who are using the same book, who go through the same method, so that you know that it's tied to the Big Ideas book that we're using. Um, and sometimes hearing it done differently, it's helped us as parents figure out how to show what the teacher is asking them to do. And so just a YouTube search sometimes helps. And I would, I would say that that, that is very much um, aligned to one of our standards for mathematical practice, which is using tools strategically. Um, I, I've been in, uh, it's been a while since I took pre-calculus, for example, and a, a few weeks ago I was in a pre-calculus class and they were doing things with matrices and 
I didn't remember what the math was. And so I, I literally sat in the back of the class and I Googled it. And um, that, that is just what learners do these days to help themselves. So please encourage your, your children to do that as well. You made me think of another thing. Um, in on the blue resource page at the very end, um, we provide a couple of links for free online calculators, and I would highly recommend a couple of them. Um, one is the Desmos Scientific Calculator, and the other is the Desmos Graphing Calculator. Both of those are free. They are the calculators that are embedded in the SBAC test. Right, so if students learn to use those, they'll be more, um, I don't know, quick, <laughs> right, right, uh, more agile <laughs> in using it when they see it on the online test. Also at the high school level, some of our schools are still recommending, some of our courses still recommend students to have a graphing calculator, which is an investment that's over $100 per device. Um, there's a free uh, app for your telephone, the Desmos graphing calculator, um, that students can download, uh, and it's every bit as functional as the graphing calculator they might be asking you to purchase. But they can't um, use their phone during tests. They can't use their phone during tests, but our high school teachers have graphing calculators in their classroom. They should be issuing to students um, during a test, but if the student has never used it before, it can be a little bit cumbersome. So that's, it's a teacher really needs to be training the students how to use that calculator on a regular basis. Um, if your student goes on to take AP classes, AP math classes, AP um, calculus or statistics, that Desmos graphing calculator is not allowed on those tests either. And so you, the graphing calculator might be unavoidable. <laughs> More questions? So the question was all all eighth graders should be finished with Algebra One before they go on to high school. That, that is not the case. Uh, about 50% of our students complete Algebra One in middle school, which means 50% of them don't. Um, and they'll take Algebra One in the ninth grade. Uh, and that can sometimes be a nicer choice knowing that students have to take four years of high school math. Starting with Algebra is, is an easier sequence <laughs> than starting with something higher. So you can take Algebra in ninth grade. Absolutely, half of our students do. More questions? Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and for, I'll thank you on behalf of all of the teachers in our school district. Thank you for supporting your children with math. We can't do this work without any of you. So thank you.